Are you also, did I make you a co-host or are you already a co-host automatically? Should so be. that you guys can, that you guys can let people yeah, in. That's a good question. Okay, <clears throat> I think we're <clears throat> ready to go. Is that right? All right, well, welcome to everybody in the room. Thank you so much. So happy you were able to join us. Thank you also to our friends online who were able to join us. It's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, I know some of you are not feeling well, but some of you are also traveling. And uh, for others of you, you just wanted a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I do want to, uh, I'm going to say a quick word of prayer, and then I have just a couple of comments before we kind of jump in uh, to the presentation and, and discussion itself. So let me pray for us uh, to start us off. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for this day. We thank you for the time that you give to us to worship, to fellowship, to be together. We thank you that you are unrelenting in your search for us. Um, not only that we've been reached, but you keep trying to reach us. You don't give up on us. We pray, oh God, that we would internalize that. Um, not only that we might turn to you, but also turn to one another and turn to others who have yet to embrace you or be embraced by you. We ask now that you be with us as we head into our time together in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. This is great to see so many wonderful folks here. So I have a question and then I have a disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they are not related, I don't think. Um, so my question is, uh, we don't have coffee right now. I've, I hear it and I feel it. And, um, and there's been a question raised about, well, what if we started a few minutes early so that, you know, folks, you know, if you're going to go out. So I just want to see a show of hands. I think the earliest that we could start would realistically be 1050. Uh, just given that, you know, sometimes services go over or whatever. So if you are, and, I, and then once coffee comes back, I think we'll go back to the 11 o'clock start time. And I'm hoping that that's not going to be too much longer, frankly. So starting early, would you be in favor of it? Please raise your hand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that looks pretty. Okay. And online. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. All right. So I'll take that in advisement. So I think what we'll do is, is we will try to adjust, uh, particularly, a, you know, certainly for next week to 1050, see how that works. And then um, I, we're, we're certainly having conversations in the leadership team and my hope, of course, is that we'll be heading back to having coffee in the not too distant future. Um, my disclaimer is, uh, so we're gonna be doing over the next um, six or so weeks, a class on mission. And I guess it's actually eight weeks now that I think about it. It's six weeks of my uh, of content and then there'll be two weeks actually when we will have folks who will be joining us from our congregation to share their experiences of missional engagement. And I'm hoping that it will be um, out of the box for you to hear about their, their experiences. Um, as I was preparing and reading, and I've been reading in this area um, since the summer, just trying to get a grasp on what it is that I wanted to do and think about, et cetera. Um, I have greatly benefited from a couple of colleagues uh, in the academic world. One of them is based in Australia, but then the other is a former colleague of mine from Bethel who's actually a member of our church. 
uh, Stina Busman Jost. So Stina Jost. And she is she's an expert in missional theology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about missional theology today. And as I was kind of prepping and getting ready, I asked her to share with me a lecture that she had put together on missional, kind of introducing missional theology. And I was like, you know, I was thinking about like the first day and I kept kind of going, winding up going back to her stuff and back to her stuff. So basically about 95% of what I'm going to present to you today comes from Stina. And I want you to know that in part because that means that this is more than just me bringing this to you. This is another person in our community and, there, and this is a bigger conversation in a sense. So the kind of things I'm asking you to think about are the kinds of things that um, other churches, other communities have been uh, also trying to think about. So let me start by sharing my screen. And getting things into shape here. So, okay, so our class is called um, Crossing the Bridge, A Closer Look at How We Live Missionally. Uh, when we were developing the title, we just loved, I certainly loved the image of the bridge. It was suggested by Trev. Uh, it's our covered bridge right over here. In fact, I think one of the names that we had thought about potentially changing the church to was the bridge, but it captures this idea of encounter, of going over but also of receiving, right? So it's a two-way kind of street. And this, this is a, a class that uh, really is, uh, and I'll talk about our aims here in just a minute uh, in more detail, but it really is attempting to get us to think, well, what exactly is mission? Um, and, um, and, and how do we wanna think about that now? We're not, you know, it's not 30 years ago, it's today. And, and therefore, we need to be allowing the spirit to update our thinking as much as the spirit is probably updating the ways that we are called to engage um, and the kinds of engagements that we're experiencing. Um, so I want to start with this question. I'll have you maybe talk about it briefly at your table, uh, and then we'll come back together in a large group. But it's a pretty basic question, actually. And it's basically, it just says, when you hear the word mission, what comes to mind? So just take a minute or two, talk with one another, and then I'll come back and elicit. We have a microphone here that we'll pass around the room. Um, all right. Folks online, here comes the breakout room.
So one more minute. Okay, so let's come back together. Our friends online are back with us. So I gave you this uh, question when you heard the word, when you hear the word mission, what comes to mind? I'll start in the, in the room here. We have a mic. Uh, so are there any initial thoughts? Come on, there was a lot of hum, hum, humming and, and mum, and I even heard mission come up several times, so. Is that, is that mic on? Hello. At our table, we, several of us went back to what we thought of when we heard the mission when we were younger and then how it has expanded or not expanded as we've grown. And um, many of us thought of mission as um, helping the heathen in, in countries that had a lot of snakes and we didn't want to go there. <laughs> helping the heathen where there are a lot of snakes. The okay. View, the view has expanded. That now. well, that does sound like the way kind of a child, like uh, an imagination that you would hear as a kid, potentially. Okay, but there's a sense though of like going somewhere else. It's a little scary. Okay. All right. Great. Other other things that came up, other concepts, other ideas. Not looking for right answer here. Just looking for what comes to mind. What came to mind? Oh, we have one in the back here. Would you? No, no, I need it for online because you're we're being recorded. That's right, or wherever. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Um, when I hear the word mission, I truly believe it is spreading the gospel, but that does not go to heathens with snakes. That goes to my children, to my sister, to myself, and that's what mission means to me. However, John had a different definition. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was taking the concept more generically and telling Terry that uh, the other time in my life that I heard this word a lot was when I was in the military. Everything involved going out on a mission. And it, and it was going out. And in many cases, one would expect it to be dangerous as well. Okay, so... So number so a couple of things here. One is just the 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 inextricably connected to the gospel and its transmission. But it's not just over there, it's also here, right? I think that's a great. And then uh, John, like this is language that has kind of permeated and we find it in all kinds of other places and spaces, right? You're talking about the military. Um, obviously corporate culture also talks about what's the mission of our organization, things like that. So that's another place where maybe that comes up as well. Um, others, like, was there another hand that went up, I think? All right, how about some of our friends online?
Elgin, looks like you unmuted yourself. Uh, I, I did. Did you have a comment? Well, it, it's a way of life. It's, it's what we do for God. It's a ministry. Mission is just part of everyday life. So in a way, it's almost like purpose, your purpose. Exactly. That, okay. All right. Great. Great. Other friends online. Uh, can you hear me, Christian? Is Pat? Yeah. Go ahead, Pat. When I see mission, the first thing I think about is missionary. And so that brings up sort of like the historical, what did the missionaries do? Uh, and they went out to people different than themselves to carry some message. Typically, it's the, it was the gospel. But now it's become much more than that. It's become helping others that need some help. And it might be some tsunami that hits Southeast Asia. or So it can be more directed towards that military kind of definition that we got a minute ago, where you go out and do a specific task. So it's kind of fuzzy. It's kind of a fuzzy concept. It can mean lots of things, as you mentioned. It, it can, and that's going to be one of the things that we're going to encounter together, that it can be a lot of things, that, which on the one hand can be confusing, um, but on the other hand actually speaks to the kind of freedom as we conceptualize, well, what could mission be for us? What is it that God's called? What kind of mission is God calling us to inhabit um, and to perform uh, partic particularly in our world? All right, this is great. So I'm going to, Jeff, did you have a comment before? One more, one more comment in the room. Yeah, I would like to ask Elgin to stop drinking coffee in his car. <laughs> we have a prohibition on coffee here, Elgin, or at least waving that cup. Oh, so good, of Jeff. It's just so relaxing to be able to sit here and drink coffee. I, I love it. <laughs> I'm going to sit, gonna, sit gonna, in Arizona and drink coffee. That's I'm going to hide him so we can't okay. see him. Well, right anyway, <laughs> this, this is kind of an interesting definition here online. It says a Christian mission <laughs> is an organized effort to spread con Christianity to new converts. Missions involve sending individuals and groups across boundaries, most commonly geographical boundaries, to carry on evangelism or other activities such as education or hospital work. So here the word mission is connected with converting people yeah and that kind of the old school and certainly a 19th definition. century yeah and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that okay yeah but this is in here as what mission the word mission means in the church or at least one definition for sure thank you thank for sure thank you jeff so just to give you a sense about our itinerary over the next eight weeks uh, these first two weeks are going to be a little bit more like theological, theoretical. So we're going to talk about some conceptions, some terms, um, some where I've got a biblical text I want to kind of urge you to take a look at. And then we're going to have about a four week period where I'm going to look at some key historical vignettes um, where we see what the transmission of the faith looked like. Um, in order, and they'll have, they'll be sort of organized around um, some key concepts that we might find useful as we think like, well, what does it mean to translate the faith to others? What does it mean to become a pilgrim, right? And to journey with others, et cetera. So that'll be some of that. And then the last two weeks, again, we will have folks from our congregation who will come in and they will talk a little bit about missional living in a sense. And the purpose for that, and I'm going to mention here in just a moment, is that I, I really, we really want to encourage our whole community to be thinking about, well, where is God calling me? Um, and that doesn't mean, you know, where the snakes are. <laughs> that can also just mean where the snakes are in my own garden or, you know, or something like that. So that's kind of the, the goal in a sense. And then uh, we're hoping to have a conclusion for this uh, in May as we kind of get past Holy Week and annual meetings. So we'll come back to that later. All right, so what are our aims? Now we kind of shift in, um, and I, I really kind of have three big aims um, over the course of our time together. The first one 
and I don't know if you can see this, I'm gonna kind of reduce everything. Uh, but it, it, it really is to reconnect to the missional sensibility, for lack of a better term, of this community. Um, my understanding is that this community has had a historic connection to doing mission of some type or another. Um, and again, I'm going to say that that was a very particular vision of what mission looked like, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, but still it was that commitment, that deep, deep commitment. And I want to help us through this conversation reconnect to that um, uh, of doing, whether it's international, local, whatever the case may be, um, reconnecting to that, that verve, that, that real nerve component that shaped this community. And I think one of the most important things about that, and I feel like my part of my case that I might normally be challenged to make in another setting, but that I think is a little bit more taken for granted to a certain extent, and we just need to sort of revive, is the idea that being engaged or living missionally, whatever we think that means, is somehow constitutive of what it means to be Christian and what it means to be community together. Like that's the way you have lived this out from my understanding. Like it would have been strange in other words to you and your community to not be engaged in one way or another in mission. Something would have been profoundly lacking about the Christian character of your community if it was not there. And so I wanna help reconnect that sensibility that this is this is part of what it means to be Christian, is to be engaged in this. And again, we're going to allow for nuance of what it, what it is exactly we mean by mission, but that sense that whatever we mean, that it's essential, that's really important uh, from my perspective. The second thing is sort of the definitional question. And, um, and I, I, the way I put it up here is a little bit more... Um, I don't know, I guess I say reckon with the problematic aspects. Part of it is I, I, there's, a, there's a valid critique of uh, certain forms of Christian mission, particularly in the modern world that happened, wherein spreading the gospel became coterminous with trying to make other people European. And, and that's what I want us to sort of, you know, question a little bit. So we wanna reckon with the prob some of the problematic stuff not so we can get rid of mission, but rather to rethink it. Because if it really is central to what it means to be Christian, we can't do without it, right? But we can certainly do it in ways that are less harmful and they're actually more in keeping with, with the gospel. So reckoning with the problematic in order to, uh, to find a new, uh, a new vision. And so as I say here, Christian missions, it's had a complex and complicated history especially in the modern era. And so one of the classes that we do in the history, not all four, but just one of them is gonna deal with some of that so that you have a sense about what I'm talking about. But if mission really is constitutive of what it means to be Christian, and certainly this community has embodied that, and I think that that's fundamentally true, how do we come up with something new, right? Or how do we inhabit mission in a different way? Um, one way that I'm gonna, kind of pitch to you indirectly is that we realize that modern missions is not mission as a whole. That there's an entire history of, you know, 1,500 years at least of the gospel being transmitted in ways that are not quite as complex or complicated or, or maybe even um, compromised as we might say in terms of the modern stuff. So I'm gonna bring some of that forward for us to consider. And then the last one is this, is this personal um, aspect. And that's, so we, we've got this kind of big overarching question about what is mission? What's the history? How are we gonna think about it, talk about it, et cetera. But I think the most important thing in certain ways is like, how does that touch you? So this distinction of mission, commission, this is one of the key things that I really love in Stina's work. Um, that I found very helpful. She kind of develops this distinction. And her argument is that in a sense, everybody's commissioned. We all have a commissioning 
that commissioning can be lifelong or it could be more episodic, right? Um, I talked about, I think if you watched the money meditation that I did a few weeks ago about feeling like, feeling sent or called into parenthood. That's not normally what you might put under the rubric of mission, but that's what I really do want us to start thinking about. That, that and maybe in some ways, it's kind of like getting back to Elgin's argument that this has to do with our purpose. So we're gonna do our best in a sense to break down one of the problems that, did, that, we, that we did inherit from the modern period, which is that there's missionaries and then there's everybody else, right? And to make the argument know that we actually are all in a sense sent. We are all, we all of us are marked by being apostolic. That's what that word apostolic means, means to be sent. We're all mission viable. We're all called into that. So commission though is a way of making that distinction that I think is helpful. So if we're all sent, what is that gonna look like in our lives? Um, and I'm hopeful, especially that those last two weeks uh, when folks in our community come in to share they're gonna just share their story, right? And you're gonna hear, how did I get involved in something? What does it look like? What did I do? How has it changed me? As just three questions to consider. And I, and, I, and I hope that as they bring that in, it sparks something for you. No matter where you are in life, young to elder, you have a calling, you have a purpose. You are here for a reason. What is that reason? All right, that's kind of the idea. All right, so the first big thing, I'm not gonna take a question now, I'm just gonna shift this in. First big thing I want us to do, uh, and that we're, we're really trying to do in a sense, is to understand that when we, when we use the language of mission, and certainly this has been the case in the modern era, we've typically talked about the church having a mission or like it's up our it's like our task is kind of the idea and one of the insights that has sort of developed over the last 50 to 60 years is that actually no the real missionary is god that god really is the one who is is missional in a sense and that we get to participate in the work that god is already doing in a sense so this first um section here about recovering the true center of mission it's not it's not just the true center it's like it's actually could even be described as recentering because we typically talk about mission as what we do and what i think we want to do is build on a foundation that helps us understand that in fact it is god who is at work in the world and that part of our task then is to discern that so where does this insight come from what are we saying when we when we do this, the first, of course, this is going to, this is sort of developed um, over the course of particularly the 1950s on, basically post-World War II, um, after the, you know, supposed Christian cultures of Europe um, completely collapsed in a variety of ways through World War II, a significant question about what does it mean to be church or Christian became uh, front and center for those spaces and places. And so they began to wrestle with these questions. And so a lot of these insights come out of that. So the modern, the, one of the arguments was that the modern conception and by modern, I mean sort of 18th, 19th and into the 20th century. One of the, one of the mistakes there is the belief that mission is primarily the work of the church. Uh, and they, they, they argued in fact, something different and it's basically what I just said, that mission is actually most properly God's work. Um, and, and that does a few things. One thing is, of course, it takes the pressure off of us. It also removes the idea that our task is to convert people, because that's not our task. Even if we want, whether we want to even use the language of conversion or not, and you're going to find out that that's something that's been questioned but what's really, what's the real thing that's going on? Well, God is the one working in their heart. God is the one driving home. God is the one bringing along. God is the one turning around, whatever it is, however we want to think about that language. Here's a quote by one of the figures, Jürgen Moltmann. Um, 
it's not the church that has a mission of salvation to fulfill the world, to fulfill to the world. It is rather the mission of the Son and the Spirit through the Father that includes the church, creating a church as it goes along the way. So God, in a sense, is missioning. And I think this actually gets back to your comment, which is, uh, and I'll bring this up in just a minute, um, that we actually are recipients as much as anyone else of God's missioning work. You and I are still being missionized by God. Think about that. Because typically it's like, oh, we're going to go out and missionize. But actually, no, you, we have, we're, we're receiving as much as we're giving. And that happens in the, in the prospect and process of that. And I want to talk about that in a moment. Okay, so what do they mean when they say this, that God has a mission? They typically rooted this in an argument about God's life. That God lives as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now, ding, 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 you know why I taught a class in the fall about the Trinity, even though a lot of you weren't able to make it. It's still available on YouTube. But it was to give you a sense about the context, the kind of God we're talking about, right? We're talking about a God who lives as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the argument that was made was that what we see in, in God's life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is not a static life, but rather a profoundly dynamic life of sending and receiving. And that, of course, is uh, typically brought out in the, in the kind of Trinitarian terminology of giving birth, right? The, the Father gives birth to the Son and to the Spirit, etc. And in that action, there's a going forth, but it's not just that Jesus or the, the son goes forth and then leaves, but rather comes back, right? And that they live in a communion. So this going forth, returning becomes sort of the foundational basis um, of how God engages us, that God is coming towards us, but God also receives something from us in that interaction. We'll kind of unpack that as we move forward, I hope. Um, it might be then another way of actually describing love. Uh, it certainly has been in the history of Trinitarian doctrine. But if we started to think about mission as an expression of love, um, we would obviously want to be careful to make sure that our mission practice doesn't redefine what love looks like, but rather that we really are thinking about actual love and how that would then inform our missional practice. But that's kind of the idea that God, if God is love and that love is seen dynamically as moving towards another and receiving the other, that's really the basis of mission. It's really about interpersonal commerce in a sense, connection, to, like it's most basic sense. I think that's a great way of thinking about the kind of basis. Now, in terms of history, uh, that internal dynamic then gets trans, you know, kind of kind of seen as the Father sending the Son into the world, and of course the Father and Son sending the Spirit into the world, and so this led to a phrase, missio dei, or the missionary God, the mission of God, the missionary God. So, uh, one of the things I want to challenge us to be thinking about as we think about what mission is, is we want to start with God. How does God engage the world? Because that becomes then the, par the real paradigm that should be most informative for us, for how we should be engaging, and even how we are engaged. All right. So missio Dei. So uh, God is understood as a missional God in God's very nature. And it's not just that God has a mission, it's that in some way, mission encompasses the way that God lives God's life, that God gives and receives, that that's part of the argument. So if we really are the people of God, which we certainly aspire to be, and obviously we know that we're on a journey in that regard, we're going to be marked by that same sense of sending and receiving that same sense of going out and coming back. All right. So that's kind of the basis of, and, and sort of the reasoning uh, for recentering. whatever it is that we say about mission, we want to start with the way that God interacts with the world. Um, and I think that's sort of central. Let me stop just for a minute. 
I know I've given you some things to think about here. It, is there, are there some things that I can clarify, um, collaborate on, questions? Hmm. Do we have a question online? That's really good. Thanks. Thank you, Algin. That the check is in the mail. Oh, John, go ahead, John. Um, thanks. Um, it, to me, there's a fundamental question about when we say mission, are we only describing it as um, spreading the faith? Or is there a secondary, uh, or maybe even if it's our primary mission of um, uh, putting our faith in action? Uh, two different things in my mind, because if we're followers of Jesus, he did a lot of healing, he did a lot, of, he was very charitable, he, et cetera, et cetera. You get what I'm saying. So if going out and doing a, a God-inspired, uh, uh, let's say, participating in something, but not necessarily claiming that you're doing it because of your Christian faith, but you're doing it just because it's the right thing to do, is that still a, uh, does that still fall under the label of mission? I think that, in fact, that's the most ancient form and I'm going to make an argument for that, that unfortunately, in the latter part of the 19th and into the 20th century, we have this bifurcation of either preach the gospel or do works of service. And what we find when we go back into the history of the church is that those things were almost never bifurcated. They were bound together. So the earliest, some of the earliest people that we might describe as in some way or another missionary, even though that term didn't actually exist, were typically also trained in the medical arts. They also had training in linguistics. They had all kinds of, so, and why would you need that? Well, you need training in linguistics so you can understand other people and not just understand their language, but understand their thought world. What, what's of value to them? What, what matters to them? But of course you, the medical training obviously is something that means that you can engage the body. So I would certainly argue that that's where we're going, John, but I haven't gotten there yet. Hey, Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Pat here, I got a, got a comment on that topic. When I was studying at Bethel Seminary, um, one of the professors had an interesting, uh, it was, he was a missions professor, it's a missions class, and he, he, his thought was that people can't hear the gospel when their stomach is empty, Yep. which means you sort of have to deal with sort of the physical needs, and then you can deal with the spiritual needs, and then then that whole that brings out the whole issue of the, the doing good works kind of stuff, not just the spiritual element of it, but it's it sort of becomes a blend of how do, how do you do that? And I think that's what good missional work is about: is blending the spiritual, the, the gospel saving stuff, and supporting the the community, the health, the welfare of the community. Yeah, and we and we'll, you will find nuances of this, like shades of nuance, where some for some folks the the preaching part needs to be quite explicit, whereas for others the doing of a work of service simply in the name of Jesus and because you're a human being is gospel enough. So you will find a, my point is that you will just find shades of that, and in a way I think that speaks also then to the contextual freedom. Like what makes sense in this context? Like, does it make sense for me to like preach a sermon to them or not? I mean, maybe sometimes it does. Maybe sometimes it doesn't at all. And maybe I am or am not equipped, et cetera. That's the kind of like freedom that you have, I think, to discern how is God working with people. So great comments here. Anything else from folks online? Okay, what about in the room? Um, right here, Janet Ruth, is it on? Um, I'm just wondering about purpose. And the reason I ask this is because I think about like the cancer patient who is, you know, has to be in bed. 24 hours a day, or I, I remember when I was in my early twenties, I was diagnosed with a mental illness and 
oh, I was completely incapacitated. I mean, I was miserable and I just, I couldn't work. I could barely function. And what, I still think I had a purpose. I, I know that I did. I mean, maybe it wasn't to send out to preach the gospel, but can you talk about that? Because I, I think that mission can be a state of being. I, if that makes sense. Amen. I mean, that's exactly, I think that's, this is exactly sort of one of the veins that I really want to push us to be thinking about, to be thinking creatively um, and, and, and not to think that you somehow God has overlooked you or that your only purpose is to be a, um, a consumer of spiritual knowledge or whatever practices or whatever. That's supposed to not only shape you, of course, but also like give you a sense of calling. And that calling can look very different in very in there and anything, almost anything is viable. So I would say this kind of meshing of purpose and mission, very important. And purpose can change. This is the other thing about mission and commission. That's it can be episodic. I mean, Rick here is going to open a restaurant. And I know, Rick, that you hopefully are going to, uh, I see you guys be like, oh, maybe don't have, maybe won't. But let me, let me follow that thinking down the line, because obviously part of that is that's your business. But at the heart of that, every time I've ever heard you talk about it is also this sense of like, you want people, you want to give them sort of an experience of delight and hospitality and, and welcome. And how is that not also mission? Even if you're not going to put on your, you know, uh, menu in the name of Jesus, right? And I'm sorry, that was me reaching into my Southern roots, but, but you get what I'm saying that that's, that's, that's what I mean by thinking creatively about this, but of course, not to the utter exclusion of that, because there are, there is a viability for telling people, this is why I love the way that I love, or this is why I do the things that I do. It's, it's shaped a certain way. And that way that it's shaped, we might describe as a Jesus way, right? All right, let me move us forward. So that recentering, and, I, and this is sort of on top, you're going to get enough history uh, over the, the four weeks that I do some of that, but I did want to give you sort of a history of the terminology of mission. Um, you would think that because of how important this word is, um, that it would have a kind of ancient pedigree, but in fact, it doesn't. Um, at least not in terms of the way that we talk about it, the way that we think about what mission is. Um, in the early church, the word, uh, what happened to my, oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. Uh, the word for mission is used almost exclusively to describe what I described earlier in the life of God. Um, you typically find it in reference to God sending the Son or God sending the Spirit. It is almost never applied to the church sending someone out. So it's never applied to Paul that way. It's never applied to any of the, 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 word, the word, even though the word exists at that point in time, it is not used primarily for that purpose. It is almost exclusively used to describe, uh, uh, to describe God. Father sending the Son, Father and Son sending the Spirit. And that pretty much is the case. And I'm going to, I'll tell you about this and share this with you later. But even, uh, and there is, in fact, an actual office of evangelist, there's never an office of missionary in the early church. And in fact, after the first 100 years, evangelist as a office or a task falls out of usage for about six centuries. But the faith still spreads. So how does that happen? Right? I mean, that's what I'm, this is why I'm trying to say we need to dissolve this notion of there being missionaries and everybody else, because in a sense, how did it spread? It spread because everybody was basically a missionary and using that term kind of anachronistically. So um, in the modern period, that really is when the term takes on the connotations that it takes on. And by modern period here, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the founding of the Jesuits. And I'll talk a little bit about that. That happens in the 16th century. So this is a Roman Catholic 
uh, monastic movement, and they really are the first ones who use mission language in the way that would feel familiar probably to you. Um, we're not gonna do a ton of stuff. I will talk about the Jesuits a little bit, but obviously our context is the Protestant, right? Context. And for about, the Jesuits exist for about 150, 200 years prior to the launching, first launching of Protestant missionary societies. And during that period, Protestants are super nervous about saying that what they wanna do is mission work because Catholics are doing it. <laughs> Um, I was, I should have said, wait for it, but none of you are your own. Um, so yeah, right, sort of this anti-Catholic element. Um, as I mentioned here, it, it preceded by Roman Catholic Church. Well, if this appears in the 18th century, so 1700s, right, into the 19th century, well, what else is happening at this point in time? This is the height of colonialism and imperialism. And this is one of the reasons why mission in the modern period becomes so deeply entangled with these problems. And that's one of the things that we wanna reckon with as a problem, precisely in order though to save, to sort of pull something out of it that still is sort of somehow important. Prior to that, you have this fusion of geography, of political power interests and the church. And that fusion comes out in uh, uh, a concept like Christendom. Have you ever heard of this thing, Christendom? Christendom was a way, um, uh, particularly of popes, of naming the geographical region in which the pope held supreme authority. And of course, that is typically you know, in Europe, because that's the time that this is developed, this idea is developed. Um, well, mission, because it's born at the same time that they start talking about Christendom, mission becomes then the extension of those boundaries. It becomes bound up with the power of the church and the power of political parties or political interests. Um, and, 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 and therefore it is most properly the work of the church, right? In other words, you could say like this, the earliest conception of mission was to extend the authority of the Pope. Does that sound like something that you think is properly mission? Probably not, but you could see why that might be a problem. Protestants will take this over and they'll do their own thing without the Pope part, but you still have this kind of entwining of mission language with civilizing people, making them Western, making them European, North American, whatever the case may be. Now the Protestants get into a different kind of problem um, and I'll, maybe I'll kind of skip this, but it's, the, it's a double bind. And that is that not only do they conflate missionizing people with making them Western, most of the organizations that do this work are not directly connected to the church. They're voluntary societies. And so what this creates is an idea that mission is something that happens outside the church. It's not somehow part of the heart of who the church is. And so that's another challenge that has to be overcome. And we've already started even in my conversation today to push back on that. Now, how do we know all this, right? Because as this stuff is going on, typically most people are like swimming in this. So it's difficult to know precisely, you know, what to do with it. Um, well, the reason they know about it is what I mentioned before because of reflections after the Second World War. And um, there's a movement that arises called the Missional Theology Movement that starts in the 20th century. Um, it's developed, as I said, in the wake of the Second World War. There's several kind of European figures that are connected to this. Uh, Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, um, Johannes Heukendijk, Newbigin, Bosch. Um, you probably have not heard of most of these figures, but they're, they're pushing back because they're like, well, what is, what is it going to mean to be church now in a largely de-Christianized culture? And in fact, a culture that was rotten at the core anyway, to produce something like Nazism. Like what, what is it? How do we recover? Um, 
they, ch they challenge the idea that mission is supposed to be about replicating the church because the church itself is part, seems to be, seemed to have been part of the problem, the, the, the nature of the church. Um, and so they pushed back on that and, and they developed basically the idea that really God is the true missionary and part of our task is to discern where God is already at work in the world. And that's where the missional theologies uh, material develops. Now, let me, let me run through quickly because there's just basically five insights uh, that come from this missional theology movement. The first one is the one we've already gone over. The origin, aim, and end or goal of all mission is God's. It's the triune God, that really God is the origin. God is the one who's overseeing it, and God is the one who's going to bring it to its true end. In other words, it's not our job to convert people. That is not what mission is supposed to be. Uh, and that, that's a huge insight. Um, so God's the true missionary, uh, Trinitarian theology, but also very importantly, the two major events in scripture that they often pointed to was the incarnation and the giving of the spirit, right? This is, these are moments in which God most profoundly engages the world in order to bring the world back, right? In order to make the world understand its value, et cetera. The second insight is that we are still recipients of, of God's missioning work, right? So your comment earlier, um, not only are we, but we actually remain, that God is constantly having to work on us, right? It basically, it's that scriptural passage that Paul has of uh, uh, God is gonna complete the good work that God began. And that, that that is the missionizing work that God is, uh, is doing. So that again, decenters us as the primary actors in mission and helps us realize that we ourselves are also receiving something. And then that's gonna become important because that's gonna actually play into how do I think about mission? Mission isn't just about me being self, have all, having all the sufficiency and bringing all my knowledge and all the insights that I have and giving it to others it's also actually about, it's about bringing that some of what I have, but actually also receiving. So there's both a giving and receiving that actually is supposed to happen. Um, so mission then, and this is I think one that you have to sort of sit with for a while. Mission is actually part of the tool that God uses to continually convert the church itself. That one of the insights that that you really, it's almost impossible to avoid this if you really take, like really look at what happened in, in the European context in World War II, and that is that the church needs to be converted. It's not the world, it's the church that actually needs to be converted. So part of the argument then is that God is continuing to do that and that, and that, that the missional engagement actually is a part of that process. The third is that mission is somehow then fun fundamentally communal. Um, right, if God is communal, right, then it stands to reason that, that mission for us is going to be that. But what they typically meant was this idea of participating, that we're called in a sense to participate. And what does that mean? That means that actually God is actually already at work in the world. God is already talking to people who are not Christians. God is, the spirit is already working on people. And therefore, what is our actual task? Because when we typically think about mission, we think about we're going out to talk or to serve, but in fact, we actually are called to listen first rather than to speak. And that is a very profound, again, change of posture about how we're gonna engage the world. So the church then is drafted into that movement um, and, and therefore mission in a sense becomes about God transforming forming people and those people then joining in in God's ongoing work of transformation. So these three insights here, origin aim starts with God. We are ourselves recipients and that doesn't stop. And we get to also then participate with what God is doing in the world because that's what God intends. Um, the fourth and fifth are ones already that we've, that we've, uh, uh, mentioned, maybe I'll, it makes it, I suppose, a little bit more explicit. 
One is that if this is the case, that, that mission becomes part of the way that God transforms us as we meet and encounter others, then to be Christian in a sense is to be engaged in mission, that it's part and parcel of the Christian life. It's not something that gets outsourced to quote unquote missionaries. All of us are called into this engagement. So we're all called and sent. What the challenge becomes discerning, what does it mean for me to be called and sent? What does that look like in the space? What do you want me to do, God? <laughs> I'm sure that's a prayer that you have prayed with no, no care about missional this and missional that. You just were asking, what on earth do you want me to do in this, you know, you know, this season of my life or whatever? So to follow after Jesus then means to take up the posture that Jesus had, which was, he was, what was he doing? He was sent into the world. He was sent. Therefore, we're going to be sent because we're supposed to be conforming our lives to his life. But where? Where am I sent? Where are we sent as a community? That's going to be localized and specific because we can't do everything all the time. We have to figure that out. We have limitations. This then is where the mission versus commission kind of conversation comes in, right? As I mentioned here, missional calling then is not only or even primarily identified with our modern conceptions of missionary work, rather it just has to do in a sense with purpose. God, is, God can use whatever we, gifts we have and can use us wherever we are located. Um, therefore, it can be something that's episodic or temporary. And I love the idea, this idea that I think fundamentally the Christian life is improvisational. And I mean that in the sort of jazz sensibility. I've used that image in other contexts, right? The, all, almost all great jazz musicians are like deeply trained in the classical standards. And what do they do? They improvise off those standards. Well, what's the standard? Our standard is Jesus. But we're not called to necessarily replicate precisely what Jesus, we couldn't even do that. Rather though, we are called and we are given the opportunity then to make our own music, to improvise, right? I think that's a very profound way of thinking about this. And then the last thing, the last insight is one we kind of mentioned before, right? The missional engagement then is gonna be part of the ongoing conversion of the church, or it's just part of growing into being a Christian. I think is one way we could think about it as well. All right, the last thing I want to leave us with, we've got about three minutes. I don't think I can do this in three minutes, but I'm going to try. Um, I've provided for you in your handout um, a, a cut and paste of Acts chapter 10, and I'm going to give you as an assignment, go home and just take a look at this passage. This is a really interesting passage, okay? And uh, let me just give you a synopsis. Basically, there's a man named Cornelius, and he's a Gentile. He's not Jewish, right? So therefore, he's really, he's, he should not be sort of necessarily included in Israel's identity. If you were uh, particularly a certain kind of Jew, you would say he is not, you know, Jesus didn't come for him. He shouldn't be an heir of the spirit or the promise of God, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what's going on? If you read the first few verses, Cornelius, even though he's a Gentile, he's been praying and he sees a vision. So God is speaking to a non-believer, quote unquote. And in that vision, basically he said, God basically says, you gotta go find Peter. So he goes and finds Peter. And in the meantime, Peter has a vision, which challenges basically the very definition of what it would mean to be church for Peter. Because for Peter to be church is also to be Jewish. And what God is asking him to do is to rethink fundamentally what his definition of church is. That no, it's not just about being Jewish. It's actually greater than that. And this is where missional work can also be uncomfortable and destabilizing because it undermines what some of our most cherished beliefs. And that would have been one of them. And Peter struggles with it. If you follow through the rest of the book of Acts, it's not like Peter later on is like, he's got it all resolved. In fact, he leaves and goes, you know, off to Antioch and he, and he, and he won't eat with Gentiles, even after he's had this vision and gone to a Gentile's house. So uh, you see that Cornelius has a vision. Peter has a vision. Cornelius sends out men. This is kind of in the outline for you. I'll just kind of click through these. 
Um, the, the men find Peter after he's had this vision. Peter agrees to go with them. And the first thing that he does, which would be scandalous, is he enters Cornelius's house, which would be an unclean space for a Jew because he's a Gentile. So he goes where he shouldn't go. And he listens to Cornelius, right? So he listens and then he starts to speak. And before he can even finish, like the spirit is just poured, there's a second Pentecost, basically. Um, I think that must be the timer, so I'm out of time. I should drop the mic. So, uh, so Peter then shares the good news with the go of the gospel with an outsider. All right, so what are some of the insights here? And again, this is material kind of called uh, that Stina shared with me. And it, it maps on pretty well, but from a biblical story. And that is that the Holy Spirit's already at work in the world. God is already doing stuff. The real question is, are we paying attention to what God is doing? Are we discerning properly and carefully, right? Um, God speaks beyond the walls, right, of the church or of communities of faith, whatever we want to say. And, and therefore, to, lit, to participate in mission means, first and foremost, to learn how to listen. And that means then educating ourselves. I mean, this is one of the reasons why we have these faith and justice forums or faith and humanities forums, et cetera. It's because there's stuff going on in other places that might actually be calling us into different postures and ways of being in the world, right? But we have to, we have to choose to listen. Um, and... And I think this is one of the most fundamental things. Peter, it, Peter is changed. Like you can read Acts chapter 10 and as it flows into 11 and kind of just read over it. And it's just like, oh, that sounds interesting. He went to a Jews, Gentile's house. And then he had to go back and explain why he went to a Gentile's house. But if you think about the actual challenge of what that meant to the earliest followers of Jesus, that was literally a world turning upside down rethinking what this whole thing was about. So that's going to mean that engaging means also receiving. That when we do any kind of missionizing work, and this is what we're going to see in the history of the church, it's going to change us. So it's not just that you're changing them or you're changing the world or whatever it is, you know, that kind of older model. It's rather, it's, it's a true bridge in which there's two-way traffic. Um, and that is then the missional call. That is the challenge in a sense. So uh, the, the key takeaways, we're here at the end, the key takeaways that I wanna offer to you, is just two. One is mission is properly God's work. I think I've hammered that home enough. <laughs> I think we're good. And then the second is that all of us are called to share in that work. Now, there's some other ancillary kind of things we could put. I think the third thing we should put in there probably is that we're going to be changed. But if you take away those two things from today, I would feel like you really got uh, what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go in our class together. Um, I have a question for you here that you can think about. I don't think we're going to take the time because I know all of you, like me, would love to have some coffee. Uh, and so I'll stop there. Let me see. Are there any comments, though, in general, um, anything that struck you from today that you would like to re respond to or, or mention? And I'll just kind of pull up our friends online here, too. just some thoughts that got triggered for me one is ever I look at neighborhood as um, these are people that I, I live next to and I live across from and I they live down the street and if I'm just one of those people I mean I, I pray I, I pray for them I pray for opportunities to get to know them um, and then just this last, this vision of Peter, it, it's just an interesting story. Um, I live in St. Louis Park and we have two rabbis on the street where I live. 
and um, one of them has four girls and I take care of two female grandchildren during the week. So when COVID hit and school was out for their kids, my little ones and their little ones spent a lot of time together. And it started out where we were always at their, at their backyard. Um, and the mother, the, the rabbi himself was just, he's just personality wise, very friendly and outgoing. The mother is very, very reserved. Um, she was very polite. Um, and then came the time where I invited him to, down to our backyard. Well, that was a, that was a definitely a big step. And she said no for the, you know, but the, the little girls, of course, wanted to pay in a different backyard. Anyway, the, and eventually they came to the backyard. Well, of course, if you're three and four and five, you have to go potty. So then it was, could, could they come in our house to use the potty? Um, at first they went home, then they started coming in and using the potty. Well, you go in the potty and then you see somebody else's toys. Anyway, so then I, I just said to her, I said, I feel really awkward to ask this, but are you allowed to come into a Gentile's house? Are you okay coming in? And she said, well, we'll come. So she says, we'll come in and we'll just stay in the back. So I have no idea their theology behind it, but eventually they came and played. And um, it, it makes me happy. And I look forward to many more times. And we, we can't do snacks together because of kosher. So I've talked about what kosher snacks could I have at my house that their kids, I mean, it's felt like a very warm bridge. Um, yeah. That reminded me of it. Anyway, yeah. the vision reminded me of it. That's great. I just, and there's so many little, I mean, you, you're being changed. You're, you, you're becoming um, aware of their needs and you're stocking your shelves with things that you wouldn't normally, you know, that, that's the, it can be that small or it can be that big. Um, and I would, I would just add that at, for, so we'll take things to them for Hanukkah, you know, and I make sure they're kosher and, and then what, three weeks ago, they knocked at the front door and they brought Christmas presents. I mean, or didn't they, wasn't it Christmas? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, they're cookies that they had baked. So it, I, I feel like I'm very, I'm warmed by it, that's, I should yeah. say. I mean, one of the things I love about it is that this is a great sort of example of also, I'm not called to convert them. I'm called to love them. Right. And that's why that's the, this idea that it's that God is the real center and engine in this. And it can look different in, you know, different kinds of settings. So thank you for sharing that. Any comments from folks online? It's like, John, you're leaning forward. Did you have a comment? No. If you do, you need to unmute. No. <laughs> OK. Elaine. Chair of the mission committee. Okay. All right. I got a thumbs up. That makes me feel good. All right. Uh, well, thank you all. Uh, we're a couple minutes over and I will end us now. And um, uh, let me just say a quick sending prayer. Lord, thank you that you, um, that you've come to be in our midst, to be one of us, uh, to bear us along and have also then empowered and equipped and, um, directed us to do the, do likewise, help us to understand and, and meditate on what that might mean, what it might mean for each of us to have a commissioning in this life. In your name we pray. Amen. So I hope we'll see all of you and maybe more next week. We'll see.